Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food & Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, and my guest today wears many, many hats. She is the co-host of the Carb Face Podcast, which if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do that right now. It will be... It'll just break you in all the right ways. <laughs> she is the uh, mother of a cat with terrible diarrhea. Yeah. And she is the <laughs> co-author of uh, Appetites and a few books in progress that, uh, well, she's writing with a co-author who, well, let's just get to it. Here is Laurie Woolever. Hello. Hi. You've had a, a hell of a year. It has been a really intense year. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was uh, Tony Bourdain's assistant for nine years uh, until his death last year in June. Yeah, and we're we're coming up upon the one year mark of this, and you are working on a couple of of co-authored books, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before Tony died, we started working on a travel book, uh, which uh, was meant to be kind of a fun project. <laughs> and I, I hope that people will still have fun with it when it comes out. But it has been uh, a very different kind of project. We, we had really just gotten started on it uh, when he died. So very fortunately for me, I have this wonderful blueprint of what he wanted. We sat down for an hour one day or more than an hour and just went through and, you know, he was very clear uh, with what he wanted out of it. So I have that conversation transcribed. And that's kind of my Bible for making this book come to life. But uh, And it's not your first book rodeo no. either with him because mm -hmm. you did Appetites, which is mm -hmm. an exquisite cookbook. Thank I, you. Oh, my God. I love the writing in it. I love the recipes. I love... Uh, the the photographs of the people in, in very involved wild, in it. and it's messy. It's a mm -hmm. hot, beautiful mess mm -hmm. in all the in all the right kind of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what was that? How long did you work on on that? That was from start to finish, uh, a little under two years, mm -hmm. and that was from you know first starting to to write and develop to publication and promotion. Uh, and that was a fantastic experience. Now, Tony and I had actually worked on a cookbook years and years ago together. Oh, right. Did you, did you, you tested and styled for that? Or? I, uh, for the Anthony Bourdain Lay All Cookbook, I right. did the recipe editing, which meant taking the recipes from the kitchen cookbooks that the chefs were using and made them into home cook you know, format working with the publisher, and then also did the testing, which I don't recommend, actually. Oh, I it's, think it's, testing is horrifying. Yeah, I, t I mean, it's it's horrifying, but also I think it's important to have a fresh set of eyes and somebody who's completely outside the project mm -hmm. actually do the testing. But, you know, I wasn't going to say no, you know, to I was in my, like, mid-20s and needed the money, and, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a great experience. But it just in terms of, like, the best possible cookbook I think it's if you can get an outside tester I think that's probably the way to go but um, as it turned out I, I think that's a great book I mean the recipes were very solid because they were very well used and tested already uh, restaurant recipes you know that just had to be sort of scaled and you know written correctly so I think that's a great book but so that's that was my first and time you, with Tony okay so you worked together on that because y'all had a long history because you did that and then there was some mm -hmm. space in between mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you were assistant and even while you were as assistant you had to periodically reintroduce yourself yes yeah <laughs> I mean we our whole relationship was characterized by really not seeing each other in person very much <laughs> which I think I can only speak for myself, but I think it suited us both really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, him because he obviously was traveling so much as part of his job uh, and me because it allowed me just to focus on the work. And, you know, I'm somebody who can sort of go down a rabbit hole of um, trying to interpret a look or a gesture or a tone of voice. <laughs> I wouldn't know what any of that is like. <laughs> <laughs> so it really just kept it sort of clean. Like I didn't, all of my like insecurity and weirdness didn't really come into play as much. And so it really was just about the work. And I, I mean, I enjoyed every minute I got to spend with him and it was, you know, always fun and exciting to see him. But we didn't have a lot of day-to-day personal contact. Um, and that was the case with the back in 2002, 2003 with the Layal cookbook as well. I mean, he already was traveling and and had this life of, of you know, of, of a television host. So everything we did was by email. So um, and I, I met with him a few times. Um, 
And then I, I, I did a one-off with him. We went to Montana in 2007 to cook a, at an event. Like he used to do these sort of hybrid events. Oh, yeah. What is that? There are people go to Montana in particular and cook at there, – there's some event that a lot of chefs – like it's a, like a plum gig for – Oh, I don't – I'm not sure about that. This was um, this was like the University of Montana homecoming weekend. Oh, that's not it. Yeah. <laughs> This was, um, you know, he was out there for three or four days. He had to cook an event. We had to go to a cocktail party. I think he had to do a lecture. And then what? the real reason I was there was to cook dinner in the home of, like, the football coach or something. And it was, like, this package that had been auctioned off for a huge sum of money that went to, I don't know, the, the, the university, <clears throat> excuse me, the university, I guess. And so it was, you know, co- dinner cooked in the home of the football coach by Anthony Bourdain, um, for eight people or something, wow. you know. So it was this um, menu straight from the Leal cookbook, um, and it was, you know, it was a breeze in that it was only for eight people, uh, and it was, but it was in, you know, a home kitchen, which was, you know, beautifully appointed, but a home kitchen, and uh, it was really, it was super fun, uh, and just as kind of a strange little one-off, and that was just because his assistant at the time, uh, I think, was heavily pregnant and couldn't oh, travel. Yeah. Uh, so then, and then we started working together in two thousand nine. So yeah, we didn't in the very. I'd say in the first couple of years, I saw him so little and my my role was more limited than it ultimately became. And, you know, and he met so many people in the course of his travels and his work that he, you know, almost like just another kind of nondescript, <laughs> like white chick with you're, blonde hair. You're very descript. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's he was but, not the first person to not remember me after yeah. having met me before. So there were, yeah. I think, two, at least two events where I had to go up to him and be like, hi, I'm your assistant. Because <laughs> I could see on his face that he was like, he kind of put to the, do the shutters math. down. Yeah. yeah, either just like didn't know who I was or was just kind of like. Watching him at events was always such an interesting thing. Thing. Mm. I would like hang back and mm. you see mm-hmm. how he's rea- you know, how he's reacting to the energy coming at him. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a skill, you know, really kind of trying to give people the experience that they're looking for because they're your fan, but also trying to keep a little something of yourself just to maintain your sanity. You I know? yeah, I, I would see him at events like once I you know <laughs> once we actually established peace in our times, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. but I would see him at events and I. You know, and I respect people's space and stuff. And I knew that I remember he came into CNN uh, to when it was announced that he was going to be doing uh, the show there. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I worked there at the time and they were doing a book giveaway. And like at CNN, you know, famous people from all over the world Mm -hmm. would come in and nobody bats an eye. Kind of like, oh, cool, look who's here. People were lined up for an hour or more to to have him sign it. And so so it was so, you know, always witness that happening, gracious to everybody, all this stuff. But I would be at a party and I, you know, I would just sort of watch him like, you know, people coming up to him and I would think like, I'm not going to steal his energy. I'm not going to do it. And every single time he'd sort of sidle up and be like, you weren't going to talk to me. (laughs) And and I would feel like the prettiest girl in the room (laughs) because like he he chose to come over and say hi. And then, you know, and, and then. It was great because we have very like directly focused conversations and I sort of tried to give him the emotional space to be like, okay, it's safe here. I don't need anything from you. We can Mm. just be humans. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was really nice. Mm. It was sort of a Mm -hmm. nice thing, but maybe he did that with absolutely everyone. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's, it was, I don't think it was so common that people would sort of think that way. It was more just like, can I get a selfie? You know, yeah. can I get a selfie? I made a, I made a point of never getting a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a picture actually of the night you, you and I met. Oh, okay. At, uh, at that, um, there was a roast. roast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So can we talk about this roast? For oh my God. It's so good. Was it a roast of him or a roast of Guy Fieri? Because it was both. Yeah. It was a roast of, it was <laughs> meant to be a roast of him, but I mm-hmm. think. For charity. I yeah. will say this was for a huge charity yeah was it city harvest or i think so it was it was some very good thing um rachel ray was was there guy fieri Fieri, mario batali but oh god (laughs) yeah a bunch of bunch of comedians yeah well that's i mean that was the great thing and so smart on who's ever part organized it is they brought in these like really good new york comedians Mm -hmm. you know because chefs are funny we know this but like you know, this was, it, this was it was such a the level of comedy was so was so it was like Gilbert Gottfried oh, right. and Artie Lang and oh. Jim Norton and just like really people that and Bonnie McFarlane. Who, she I mean, was 
incredible. She yeah. just, she blew me away. She just zeroed in on everything about everyone. Mm-hmm. I think, I think Guy got it the worst. Yeah. And he was a great sport. He yeah. was a tremendous sport, I felt. Yeah. <laughs> He just got a star on the Walk of Fame. I saw that. And like a kiss on the cheek from Matthew McConaughey. Who doesn't want that? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Congrats, man. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I met you that night um, just for <laughs> for a backup. You and I have talked mm-hmm. about this in the air before. But uh, when when Tony I met and I met, it was uh, not under great circumstances. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had written something. I was on the James Beard Journalism Committee and he had written something. He was still working at Travel Channel and had written something on his blog about his problems with the awards and how it was a goat rodeo and how basically all food journalists were grifters and and Mm. I I I took tremendous exception Mm. uh, with this and uh you know he was saying that uh, you know I was like you're damning Jonathan Gold and like sort of all of these other incredible journalists like in the same breath as like a few notorious grifters and stuff and what the hell and I was I was sort of pleased with myself because I had done the whole thing as a giant elaborate golden shower joke Mm -hmm. and uh he and I woke up the next morning and he was laying into me on Twitter and I was responding under like the CNN etocracy account Mm. and we were going back and forth he's trying to rope other people into the argument rope in Mario Mario was kind of like I'm staying out of this Mm. and uh you know we're going at it and I got a frantic call from CNN PR saying you have to stop. You have to stop now. I got in trouble oh. at work. <laughs> um, I had to be spoken to about the official social media thing. I didn't know at the time that he was coming to CNN. Um. And so that was the thing because, you know, he could turn on it on a dime. But the thing is, we had enough mutual friends mm-hmm. who I think Eddie Wong uh, stepped in. I think maybe Doug Quint and said, like, y'all are on the same side yeah. <laughs> and you just don't know it. So that particular night... I was having to interview people on the red carpet, and mm-hmm. I was scared to death. Wow. That, uh, and he came along, and as you know, very tall, tall person. Yeah. And I interviewed him, and then he sort of leaned into me and said, "We're going to be friends." And I said, "Okay." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, and you were there. We all went to the big gay ice cream truck. That's right. <laughs> at afterward, the, at the end of it, and that was. Uh, yeah, that was the beginning. <laughs> was, so I got to I got to meet you then, um, and then I would encounter you at parties throughout the year. Apparently, you were at a party at my house. Yes, yes. And I was unaware of this back in my drinking days. <laughs> this was a, a, like a Kentucky Derby party. Yes, I we think. used to throw this huge party every year. And I had already been to a previous Kentucky Derby party where I availed myself of many cocktails, <laughs> and then came to your house, and then was. Um, I don't know, shy, I guess shy. I could, you know, I feel like I'm pretty good at like sensing other people's energy or whatever. And I was like, this woman who I only met once before is has a house full of people. She's cooking, she's hosting. I am not going to, it's sort of what you're saying about yeah. Tony. Like, I'm not going to like steal her energy. And also like, I am, for some reason, there's nothing more terrifying in the world to me than like an awkward conversation oh, God. that I can't gracefully get out of, or there isn't like some sort of hard stop that's outside of me. Oh, so it's so hard. I just I, I and I you know I was drunk, and so I I remember sitting in the backyard talking to Allison Robicelli and Dana Cowan, and that's when I met my now podcast partner Chris for the it first was time. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I fully process that that is the first time. Yes. You met each other, and Chris was there, and he was nervous about meeting uh, Pete Wells because oh, he had yeah. taunted him on Twitter mm-hmm. uh, many times. Did they ever meet? They did, and it was fine. So funny. <laughs> People think Chris is this like terrifying monster based on some of his Twitter activity, and then uh, he's he just like shit food blogger is his his name yeah. on which stands for shit food blogger say because it started out he was a food blogger. That's right. right. That's right. I hadn't realized that that was, or maybe you had told me that, and it sort of funneled away somewhere. I didn't realize that was where the magic happened was yes. in my backyard. Yeah. I mean, I, it was brief. I was drunk and I was just like, I, don't know. I think I said you complete me to him. And then I was <laughs> mortified. Uh, but yeah, that's where, and actually, you know, you're saying about um, Tony and your sort of early Twitter at interactions. That's how I first started talking to Chris online is because Tony had taken exception with some things that he was saying mm-hmm. about, I think, Jose Andres. And, mm-hmm. you know, Tony was an incredibly loyal Very. friend. Once and he's so, on your side, he's on your side. Yeah. And, and he was a fan of, of what Chris <clears throat> did. I think he loved the shit stirring. Yeah. But then when he came for somebody that was in Tony's, you know, uh, 
on Tony's team, he was like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. And sort of, you know, uh, gave him some shit about that. And to the point where I then reached out to Chris, who I thought was a, a woman, an a unemployed people- woman living in like somebody's basement. As a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I saw what happened. I hope you're OK. You know. Yeah. Um, and we began this this correspondence. Um, and it took me a while to realize like, oh, he's actually like a um like a functioning adult <laughs> with a job and a family. Plays a character. Yeah, he was playing this character that was like kind of tragic and, you know, insane. Um, so With the dead daughter. Lemonades. Uh, lemonades. Yeah. Lemonades. <laughs> Which I asked him about that one time and he explained to me that it was, uh, that there was this phenomenon among food bloggers that they would sort of use their children shamelessly, f- to, you know, to, to forward whatever narrative they had until suddenly the child became like not useful and then you would never hear about the child again <laughs> sort of like the brother on happy days who mm. all of a sudden was gone after the first season that's right who Chuck. like went to war or something. i think so and never came back yeah and they never spoke about him <laughs> oh my god but we're happy speaking days. about you now chuck yes we miss you we think about you <laughs> wow that's a real it's real <laughs> we just lost all of our millennial listeners oh sorry millennials <laughs> Happy Days. That's like one of the first TV shows I remember watching as a real little kid. Yeah, TV, it's a funny thing. And now we have podcasts and now we're all walking around with people's voices in our head. Mm -hmm, And and people have your voice in their head. Mm. Um, Tony was your producer. Yes. (laughs) Which, I mean, (laughs) was he in there on the soundboards? Was he doing editing? No, not so much. (laughs) But he really generously and totally, um, to my surprise, uh, when he heard that we wanted to do a podcast, I think I'd mentioned it to our mutual agent. Um, and he came to me and said, I heard you want to do a podcast, you know, whatever, uh, whatever you need me to do, if there's something I can do, you know, clearly, that's not like, you know, huge suck on my time. But if there's a way that I, I can be useful to you, please let me know, because I would love to get involved. Um and I was like, are you sure? You know, and then he said this thing that always makes me laugh when I think about it now, because it was so um, it was so uplifting at the time. But now I'm just like, wow, that is that did not bear out, which was he said, you know, you're going to make a ton of money on this thing. He was like, <laughs> he's like, do you know how much money Joe Rogan makes on his podcast? <laughs> which I was like, oh, yeah. You know, but I, as it turns out, um, I am not Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> you're my Joe Rogan. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, you know, God bless Joe Rogan, but I, you know, I, mm-hmm. I, I've never had a um, a uh, syndicated uh, television show, and uh, I'm, I'm just not Joe Rogan. So y- even with Tony's name attached, mm-hmm. uh, so we decided to make him our executive producer, mm-hmm. and he did, in fact. Uh, so we would record with him for maybe 45 minutes to an hour at a time, and then we would cut up those segments and and attach one to each episode. Um, and even with his name attached and even with him on every episode, you know, we have had to hand sell every, uh, Mm -hmm. every person that listens and it's just, you know, the, the, the market is so saturated. So, but it was what a wonderful thing, you know, and totally generous and unselfish of him just to say like, I want to do this. You know, I mean, this guy did not have a lot of free time. I would imagine. no. Um, and you, if it's okay to talk about this, you Mm -hmm. did an episode Three days after his mm-hmm. death, yeah. and it's it's raw and it's angry and it's all of the things. Mm-hmm. And I I was so grateful that you did that um, because I, I rem- you were one of the first people I reached out to mm-hmm. uh, the day that I, I I found out. I mean, you probably found out just a little bit before the rest of us. I woke up, my phone was exploding, and I, I remember I. Uh, screamed mm. and my husband had just left and I called him back and he said, Do you need me to stay? And I'm like, no. And and I I let myself break down briefly because then I knew that I was in a unique position that day because I already had established, you know, a couple of years old, like, you know, two and a half year old at that time project about um, chefs and, and mental health. And this is, you know, not to speculate anything about him or that, but I mm-hmm. knew that there would be a ripple effect in, sure. uh, in the community because, you know, I had originally started the project because a couple of of chefs killed themselves Mm -hmm. you know several years ago and I I realized that there was this monstrous uh, crisis in the industry and I thought like okay um and I had a Facebook group that I had started the year uh before on on there and all of a sudden I noticed there are all these like you know members coming in there and and stuff and I thought like okay I have to I have to lock my feelings in a lockbox Mm -hmm. uh I have to I wasn't working at Food One yet but I 
they knew that I, I knew him and that I was the person on, on staff who probably knew him better than anybody else on, mm-hmm. on staff. And so I had to write a piece, but then do like seven, eight, like TV and radio things mm. throughout the day. And uh, I kept, and I just had to lock my, my shit down tight and not yeah. let it go. And I held on to it for months and, mm. and put it away and stuff. But, you know, I, uh, the fact that you were able to go on and articulate um, what you were feeling at the time is a, a tremendous uh, generosity thing that you did. I yeah. didn't, and Thanks. I didn't know what to do for you, so I think I sent you a note and some sharpies. Yes, <laughs> like, yeah, and some candy. Yeah. yeah, the sharpies. That was so. It's like, yeah, who doesn't need fresh sharpies in their lives? And I had actually just moved into a new apartment, so it was like, it was perfect. Because you were going through some shit yeah, already. Yeah, so about a month before Tony died, my husband and I split up. And uh, Girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was um, tumultuous in its own way, certainly. And, you know, we have, a, we have a son. And so I was sort of handling all of the logistics and all of the everything that goes along with that life change and had... I remember the night before Tony died saying to a friend on the phone, you know, I was in my new place and I was starting to get furniture. And I said, you know, I feel like, okay, it's been a really awful month, but things are starting to feel a little less like I'm not on like emergency level 10 every second of the day. Like I can breathe. I can sleep. I think I'm going to eat some dinner. You know, like things are starting to feel, So you're a person who takes care of a lot of people. You and I have talked about... You know, care and feeding of uh, difficult men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in various ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a strange thing, you know, to, to leave the home that I was in with my husband and my son and to uh, to not have that. You know, I remember as I was kind of on my way out and I was like, how do I still, how do I still like, you know, who am I? Like, what do I, what's my purpose if I'm not like constantly you know, thinking about the next meal for three people and yeah. laundry and all of the sort of just the stuff of taking care of a family, a small family, but a family nonetheless. A family, yeah, with uh, the cat with diarrhea. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's caretaking. There was caretaking involved with my job with Tony. I mean, it was, you know, it was more just like keeping all of the details of a life organized and accessible and, you know, transparent to everyone that was in the circle. So, to, to lose the family life that I had known for, uh, you know, 10 years, and then a month later to lose that that person who I had really, I have said this before, that, you know, Tony was kind of my organizing principle. You know, it was like that was who I was, I felt most accountable to outside of my son. Um, you know, just sort of how I structured my days, the decisions I made, everything. You know, Tony was sort of the center of a lot of people's universe. It's a lot of gravity. Yeah, yeah. So a few days after he died, right after he died, I think Chris said, let's record. I, I'm, you know, let's just see what happens. If it's too painful, we won't do it. But let's just get in the studio and see what happens. And it can be as long or short as you want. Because I worry that if we don't do it now, we may, we may not do it. And I want to keep doing it and I gotta say this podcast I mean it like I said I have not made a dime on it it's um uh but it's absolutely a labor of love and it's something that's definitely you know buoyed me uh for the past year just the the fun and silliness and ridiculousness of it and also a space to talk about you know some more kind of serious things yeah I've seen you I've seen that space morph more and more into you know you talked about sobriety Mm -hmm. on it Mm -hmm. um because I remember you had told me uh, like when you stopped drinking, mm-hmm. um, you, you told me, and, and I remember being at a party with you. We were sort of uh, like post James Beard party, mm-hmm. uh, like the l- last Lucky Peach party, yep. <laughs> and sort of trying to figure out like you know how to be because it's a different social negotiation. Yeah, when you know that party was notoriously chaotic. Mm. And was that the one at and- the, the park? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Which is weird because it's sort of decorated like you're outside, but you're inside yeah. at the same time, and. Um, I, yeah, and I, I think I wasn't, uh, maybe wasn't drinking right then too, because I just, I, w- I was just getting diagnosed then with, you know, various gut things and endometriosis, mm-hmm. and I was on medication and trying to figure out what the hell about my diet. So mm-hmm. I, yeah, so I had actually just that day uh, gotten some word about like what my, my gut condition was and what mm-hmm. I couldn't, couldn't do, and I was just in a sort of tailspin. So mm-hmm. it was kind of nice to have, you know, so I, oh, I remember we were on a quest to find water. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a scarce resource in those situations. Yeah, luckily more and more so. I, I've any event that I'm involved in, I 
make sure that there are there's water there's non-alcoholic stuff there's Mm -hmm. space to you know be Mm -hmm. a a sober human being i i you know just for 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 me it's medical like sort of going in and out of of drinking just because like for for gut stuff for me but so you had Mm -hmm. made the decision at that point and Mm -hmm. then you've uh you know sort of as we're saying like some some programming around it yep yep uh so yeah well I, i decided to quit drinking um in March of 2017. Um, and I will, I, I don't think I was really talking about this at the time, but I can say now that I was still, um, still smoking a ton of pot. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. You know, it was like one thing at a time, you yeah. know, and that's just, that was my, uh, that was the way that I needed to do it. Um, mm-hmm. Because I was just, you know, really self-medicating mm-hmm. a lot. And uh, so I thought, well, let me start with drinking. And that made a huge difference, positive difference in my life. Um, and I knew at some point I probably should stop smoking pot too, but that was just my first love. And like, you know, <laughs> I just... A long-term relationship. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, we're in this funny place now where um, it's, you know, it's becoming more and more legal in more states. I just and... started. Oh, uh, I mean, not even smoking. Well, I have medical, I have a medical card. Uh-huh. So I, you know, so I actually like legit have a card yeah. from the state and it's, and it's for pain and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, it's never gotten me like high or anything like yeah. that. But yeah, it is a funny space. Yeah. And everybody's got different relationships relationships with it. Yeah, it's um you know, if if it's like anything, if you can use it responsibly, if you can use it without abusing it and it doesn't cause harm to you, like great, you mm-hmm. know, go for it. Um and I know it's got a lot of amazing benefits. Um for me, it 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 made it ha- it's make it had made it harder in a way because it's like, well, it's, you know, it's socially acceptable and more and more so and you know, I can go doesn't to California. Smell anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um but I, you know, it I knew deep down that I was abusing it just like I was abusing alcohol. Now this now the side effects are not the same and mm-hmm. you know I could I could maintain better and it was um you know it wasn't the same d- totally destructive force that alcohol had become but at the same time it was not helping me get my work done, you know, yeah. or be a good parent or even really deal with all of the emotional upheaval of the last year. I did, I mean over the summer I was like I'm just, you know, I just checked out for the whole summer I mean, pretty much. Th- yeah, I, I, I think that's entirely <laughs> understandable. And I, I know that especially when somebody dies by suicide, it comes in waves. Yep. I've, Absolutely. I've lost friends. I've lost very dear friends uh, that way. I've had friends who have, uh, I'm just going to, by the way, shout out, mm-hmm. um, if this is too hard for people to listen to, whatever, mm-hmm. check out Fast Forward. Yeah, do whatever. We can have it in the episode notes. Uh, also, 741741, you can text it 24 7, and there's somebody there who will listening who will listen to you if you are struggling with thoughts of, mm-hmm. um, you know, self harm or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, it's Crisis Text Line, and it's really, really awesome. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, it, it comes in, and you never, you never know. Um, when when those are going to I know for yeah. me I uh, you know for, for this in, in particular you know I'm you know much you know outer circle than than you you're much f- further into it, but I still I you know I locked it for months and and it was uh real detrimental to to me I, I spiraled kind of because I, I mm. ended up going around the country for uh several weeks talking to to chefs in small locked rooms about um suicide and just mm. sort of locked it back myself and didn't deal with my own stuff and I, I sort of did the opposite of the checkout which was not good mm. mm-hmm. so what what did summer look like for you uh just a blur of <laughs> <laughs> I mean you know I, I I had a lot of anxiety f- for any number of reasons you know I, I had I knew that at some point my job was going to end. I mean, yeah. it ostensibly ended the day that Tony yeah, died. Work for a but, uh, <laughs> a- but I had a few months of, of sort of, you know, severance and, and health insurance and, you know, be- to sort of figure out the next step. And then I had this tremendous anxiety about, um, uh, about how I was going to finish this travel book. You know, as we worked together on the cookbook, I was expecting it to be the same with the travel book where there would be a lot of... Um, you know, passing something back and forth and, you know, writing something and getting, you know, getting his input and refinement on the, uh, the original blueprint. So, you know, it was like, how am I, how am I going to, how am I going to finish this book? You know, and I just got my advance and I don't want to give it back because now (laughs) I'm, you know, a single mom, like holding up my own household. 
Um, so now not only do I not have, you know, I'm about to lose my steady income and my health insurance, but I also like have to write, somehow have to write this book. Um, wow. And then and then sort of the anxiety of, of not doing it every day, you know, of just not being able to sit down and do it. And it was like these, somebody had said to me early on, um, after Tony died, somebody from the sort of inner circle, uh, such as it is, uh, said, well, my advice to you is to just get just get busy right away, you know, which I think <laughs> could work for, for some, some people. people. <laughs> yeah, for me, it, did, it was not something that I was able to do. Um, but I know in part it was because I was like, I would get up and I, maybe I would have breakfast and then I'd be like, well, time to hit the weed pen, you know, yeah. and then that does it doesn't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I needed some numbing and that's what I yeah. that's what it was giving me but at, at some point it was not um it was not serving me you know and I you know I have a, a child like it's like you know who had started to connect the dots like you can't walk around anywhere in New York City and not smell weed at this oh, point you yeah know? and no, he's absolutely. a smart kid so it was like at some point he's that's gonna realize smells like. <laughs> yeah the smell in my room and the smell on the street mm. is the same thing uh so um so yeah, my summer was just, a, I mean, it was a blur. I, I I did get to go to Paris with a friend for a week, and that mm-hmm. was like a wonderful escape, and I was researching the book. I mean, the only thing I really could do uh, reliably was travel. I was, I kept trying to sort of run away. You know, I was like, oh, if I'm, if I'm, I'm not mm-hmm. in my home and I'm not in my space, then I'm at least, you know, and then I'm like working because I'm research. I would go to the places, some of the places mm-hmm. that are going to be in the book and, and revisit some of the things that, that Tony did, um, which was surprisingly less painful than I, like the things that, that you would think would be painful, you know, like some people would be like, oh, I don't, I, I hate to bring it up or, you know, it's like, yeah there's this misconception that if somebody brings up the name of the person who has yeah. died or something about it that it's going to remind you and open up a fresh wound and it's like the that wound is is open you know yeah. there's no i haven't forgotten about it because nobody has said his name in 5 minutes you know right uh the person the person is present as hell yeah when you i liked it like when my my the first friend of mine who died by suicide uh dave i uh he was one of my, he had tried before. He was one of my best friends in college. And luckily, like his girlfriend at the time found him. And then this next time, you know, it, you know, it finished mm-hmm. him. And people were tiptoeing around me. And I, because I wasn't around people who knew him um, anymore. Because uh, we'd all, he, we were, uh, I'd graduated college. He had, you know, taken, he was depressed and, mm-hmm. all, and, drank a lot and so, and so it had taken him a while longer to be in college and uh he, he uh so I was I, you know I, I had gone away and I was around people who didn't um know him and and so I I was, I was craving mention of him mm-hmm. um my, my friends around me did warn me if there was like suicide in a movie or something like that they would kind mm-hmm. of pre-screen everything mm-hmm. for me mm-hmm. especially if the methodology matched up and yeah. you know and all that and because they they were looking up for me there but I craved people other people's stories I was in a lot of touch with our group from from college and but I know it's a different thing for you because this had to be such a strange thing for you and for all the people sort of in the center because he had this incredible ability to make everybody feel like they knew him like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what very few people in the world in possession of that kind of thing where, you know, I was talking with a lot of chefs who were saying like, I didn't know him, but I felt like I did, but you mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you get mad. Is it, what is the feeling? Yeah. You know, I, I, I knew him and then I, I, I have realized through the process of talking to the other people in his life and doing interviews for this, this other book, the oral biography project yeah. that, um, you know, you can never like them. It's sort of like something that he would talk about a lot. Like the more, the more you learn, the less, the more you realize you don't know. You know. Yeah. So I've every single person I've spoken to, some of whom I I worked with, you know, for years, I've learned some new facet of Tony or some <laughs> story. Um. So, but you know, I I knew him. I knew him to an extent. You know, yeah. and I I definitely I knew where he was every day, and I knew a lot about him, but certainly not everything. Um, he was a very, very private person in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. So, um, yeah, it's a really, you know, I've never lost anybody to suicide before. There was there was a, a, a girl I knew uh, that I was friendly with in college, but, um, you know, yeah. I wasn't close with her. And it was still was very sad, but um, this was certainly the closest 
of that type of, of death. I mean, um, yeah, there, you know, there's, like you said, there's sort of a range of emotions and there's, they come in waves, you know, there's certainly some anger. There's a lot of, um, what I found helpful, and I think some of the people around me felt the same way, was for the first few months, just kind of, you know, telling each other this, sometimes the same stories over and over again, or the yeah. sta- the same sort of accounts of the the days and weeks leading up to it, and just sort of getting a sense of where he was. And I think what we were trying to do, you know, there's such a sense of, of there can be such a, a misplaced sense of, of guilt yeah. or of regret at things not said or, you know, actions not taken. Um, so I think there's a, there's a sense of trying to put the pieces together and figure out a way in which to, to really come to understand that this was one person's decision. This was, a, this was an adult making a decision about their life. And uh, as, as much as it hurts and as much as it makes us angry and as much as it makes us feel that we have failed, that it's not, it's not really the case, you yeah. know, that, that all of us that, that knew him, loved him as best as we could, you know, supported him the ways in which we, we could, that we knew how, that we were allowed to. Uh, and ultimately, this was a decision that that he made, you yeah. know, um, and that it wasn't because this person didn't say that or this person wasn't there or, you know, I mean, there were there were there were some of his closest friends that were with him. And um, I think it's, you know, there's degrees of more or less, you know, sense of I mean, I feel lucky in a sense. I was isolated by a continent, you yeah. know, um, and I did not have the kind of relationship with Tony where um I would expect him to call me in the middle of the night and right. say I'm having a hard time. So I was I I you know if I can call myself lucky I was kind of relieved of that burden of like if only, you know. Yeah. But I still, you know, it's it didn't stop me from going back over timelines and talking to all the other people and you know what, you know, what could have should have would have, you know, because I think that's just part of the process of trying to accept what has happened. Um, you know, I, I would end a lot of conversations saying like well, it doesn't fucking matter because he's dead anyway, you yeah. know, <laughs> which uh, the funny is like, I, you know, I, I know other people who are close to him and there was that sort of immediate like hard uh, thing. But, uh, you know, you see it's self-preservation. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one, you know, particular person like in those those first few days was, you know, either n- numb or flip or whatever. And I thought mm-hmm. like. Let's see where that goes. And, you know, and and the thing is, everybody reacts how they need to Mm -hmm. right then. And then months later, I saw the sinking in Mm -hmm. of that Mm -hmm. and and the processing and like the God damn it, God damn it, God damn it. And sometimes it's sometimes it's years later. Sometimes it's, you know, right. There's there's no right reaction. And Mm -hmm. it's it's so complicated. And I will say there's nothing that no one thing anybody can say that's going to change it. No magic thing, no magic, you know, number. There's, mm-hmm. there's just, mm-hmm. it's a decision that happens and it is irrevocable yeah. and, uh, you know, irrevocable, irrevocable yeah. whatever it is. And the thing is no one person's going to be able to, you know, flip that. And I, I understand that guilt from having, you know, lost people that way. And, and you can internalize it. I mean, I think the way I, I sort of dealt with, with things and I was thinking like, Oh, you know, there was it was not a dire DM. Mm-hmm. Um, the last last my last exchange with him was he was real he was super angry mm-hmm. about not anything I did, but uh, there was some reporting around a bad man, uh-huh. and yes. uh, he was trying to get me to like go bulldog after that. And I mm-hmm. said like I love you, I'm not your hench girl. Yeah. Oh, good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he was trying to bait me, and I like reached out to another friend. I'm like oh, Tony and your DMs too. Like, yeah. and, and she was like yeah, um, but I was uh, you know I was like you got to work that one out on your your own hun yeah. like because it's uh i'm like I, I see that you have all this anger that is placed in you know in this one particular place because he was i mean he was super vocal at mm-hmm. the, the end about uh you know a whole lot of, of stuff and i was thinking like i'm not being um you know i'm not going on the attack for you as much as i adore you mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know i think he respected the boundary yeah yeah it's but, not easy yeah but you know the the thing like nothing you know there's no magic thing in there there's yeah. nothing that you know, and that's and that's sort of when some of the sadness sets in because you think like, what haven't I done? What have I done? And it's hard to accept the 
futility of some things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I will say I also, I've been seeing the same therapist for 20 years now. Yay, therapy. Uh, <laughs> it's really good shit. Yeah. Uh, so I I used to go every other week just because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and then once my marriage fell apart, I started seeing her every week. Mm -hmm. And then that's just, that actually hasn't changed. Although I, it's got to because it's <laughs> very expensive. It's really expensive. Uh, but so I, and I can't say enough good about, about having a therapist every week. Um, and just by terrible coincidence, she had her own unexpected loss at the same time, uh, like a few weeks before Tony died. Oh. Uh, so we have, it's really enhanced our therapeutic relationship yeah. because we're in some ways going through a similar uh, feeling of loss and, and disconnection. And so that's been great. So, um, you know, I grew up um, sort of in a family that was suspicious of therapy and it just wasn't something that Self -care, people Self-care not did. at the forefront necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I think it was just a combination of, of culture, of place, of time, where it was extremely, if somebody was in therapy, it was because they had a real bad problem, you know? <laughs> right. Um, and I also, I mean, I also grew up in a town where, like, you couldn't conceive of that anybody would be gay, you know? And right. that, of course, turned out to be not up? true. Upstate New York, <clears throat> excuse me, outside of Syracuse, a right. small village called Chittenango. Um, and so, again, it was like time, culture, and place where... You know, you didn't go to therapy. Everybody was straight. Uh, you know, all of these sort of like myths that we know not not to be true. Right. Uh, and uh, but I, like I said, I've been in therapy for twenty years. And uh, if if you know if you can figure out a way to afford it, or if you can you know get yourself, I, I think that is it's just it can be so tremendously helpful. I think I'm at. Uh 32 years oh on and off of, yeah, of yeah. therapy, but I will honestly say it, it saved my life. Um, you know, I, when I was, you know, 14 and feeling suicidal, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I was super depressed and my parents got me into therapy and it absolutely saved uh, my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's constant, it's work, it's constant yeah. work to be okay. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, in the in the food community, in the chef community, particularly, you know, I'd, I'd started this project, Chefs with Issues, uh, January 1st, 2016, because mm -hmm. um, there there had been some deaths, including Hamaro Kantu, mm -hmm. um, you know, in mm -hmm. in uh, Chicago. Um, the, you know, that was very sudden and surprising to a lot mm -hmm. of people. And then there are some that are off the record um, there. It happens a lot. Uh, it happens a, a lot in the community and people don't talk about it and they don't call it suicide and, yeah. you know, and it just doesn't get reported. Um, but I remember the, the month after I started this, there were three prominent ones. Mm -hmm. I started in, in February 2016, three in a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I couldn't necessarily get people to talk about some people were really ready to talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. Some people were, were like, hell yeah, let's go. Um, and uh, some people were like, no. So I, th so in August of 2016, I gave a keynote at Mad Symposium in Copenhagen. And mm -hmm. I got up. This was the scariest thing I'd done. Um, and I got up in front of several hundred of the most prominent chefs in the world at, you know, Renee Red Zuppi's conference and said, like, yeah, uh, people are dying and people are suffering and we have to talk about this. And it was such a split reaction. How, and then we had breakout sessions after that. And I couldn't believe I was sitting in a tent with like 80 like hardcore, like well-known chefs from around mm -hmm. the world wanting to talk about it. And we had a breakout the next day, too. And then, um, you know, finding out that there were other people uh, who were very much opposed to it. Like, mm -hmm. what you know, why are you trying to make us wusses? Why are you trying to you just shut up and cook? Why are you trying to destroy culture? And my take was always like, I'm not telling you you have to do anything. I'm just saying there's help here if, mm -hmm. if you need it. Mm -hmm. And I went back and spoke um, this last summer. And it was, you know, not on the main stage, but I did two breakout sessions. Not a single person argued with the fact since June 8th wow. of this last year, not a single person has argued that this is something that we have to talk about. Um, the membership of the Facebook group that morning was 828 people. Mm. It's very close to 3,000 now. And wow. much of that growth happened in the, week, in the month after. Um, the conversation opened up. The ripples also opened up because I saw a lot of people thinking like, well, if he 
wasn't happy being alive what the hell here right. and so you know we, we've had a lot of conversations like look the community takes care of its own in in some ways that maybe it didn't before yeah yeah yes wow yeah it's um it, it's a really hard I think it's a hard thing for people to face in this industry because it's like Already there's, you know, the, the talk immediately goes to like, well, it, our, our margins are low. How can we take care of, you know, taking care of people involves money. And we're already, you know, scrambling for the last dollar. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's I, I spoke about this at uh, Women Chefs and Restaurateurs oh, last month. A friend of mine was in the audience and said it was incredible. Oh. I, I think you've <laughs> spoken a couple of times recently. You spoke at something in New York. I spoke at Bitten last fall. OK, yeah, that had a huge effect on a friend of mine who was absolutely just blown away oh, and wow. stuff. So, you know, people, when you, we talk, people are, are really, really listening when you talk. You're a very powerful and effective speaker. Thank you. And yeah, the, I've, I've, yeah. Tell that to my son. Uh, yeah, I'll t- <laughs> tell your son, I'll tell your agent, I'll tell <laughs> anyone you need. But yeah, what, what you're, you out there having these conversations, it matters a mm. lot. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, I want to be very careful not to speak for Tony. Absolutely. Or to speculate too much. But just, I mean, the fact that, that his death was this kind of organizing uh, yeah. uh, catalyst to get people to sort of face it. But, I, you know, I think it's a sc- it's like anything else that's like a scary reality. It's like, let's, you know, I knew, I think I knew deep down that I had a problem with alcohol for years, yeah. but it's like, well, I'm just going to talk about it, you know? Yeah. So I think it's, you know, if it's an industry-wide problem and, and there's something inherent to the way that we're doing business that's, mm-hmm. that's really... Um, causing people to have mental health problems or to exacerbate or at least not address. Or, yeah, not go to therapy because then you're, you know, put your head down and cook. Yeah, or you can't afford it or you don't have time. Yeah, or some systemic you know. stuff. Because, yeah, people don't have any money to deal with yeah. this. So I think it's just a hard, it's just, it's it's easier. It makes people angry because they're afraid. And that was yeah. kind of the 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 key point part of my my lecture it wasn't a lecture my talk at <laughs> uh, at women's chefs and restaurateurs was and I've really realized this in myself is that a lot of anger is just like sublimated fear oh, you know people are terrified mm-hmm. people are absolutely like it's uh, you know David Chang did a podcast pretty soon after and he's been on this podcast mm-hmm. And I saw him go from that that mad in 2016, like, you know, he was talking to me about some stuff, but then we did a podcast with, with Daniel Patterson where Daniel was super open about mm-hmm. stuff and, and, mm-hmm. and David right. just yelled at him and we actually erased the podcast oh, wow. because Daniel asked him to uh, ask the producer to erase it. Oh, wow. um, yeah, but David uh, he did a podcast pretty soon after where he was just like, shit, I should have been talking about this. And he's, you know, since come to me and said like, you know, hey, I should have been talking. And I was, you weren't ready. Mm-hmm. So it manifested mm-hmm. in, uh, you know, and I'm, I can say this stuff openly because he talked really openly on, yeah. on this podcast about it. Like, so he would just yell at people and be angry because he was, you know, scared of his own head. And, yeah. you know, having stuff locked in your head is hard shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I realized that the ways in which I get angry like at my son in particular is you know if I'm angry about something it's because you know and not so much anymore because he's 10 and he's a little more but when he was like a little kid I would get angry because he would you know run into the street or you know do something that was putting at him him in danger so it's like it's easy to see that that's it's like I I feel afraid and that's making me so uncomfortable that it makes me angry yeah you know and I think that that is just if we can sort of keep that in mind and it's like all right well then what do we do about to keep to give people a better sense of security in yeah. this business and make them feel less afraid. And I, I talked about um, Kelly Fields at I uh, love her so at Willa Jean much. in New Orleans. Yeah. Um, and and she's not the only one, but she's someone that I interviewed um, f- uh, for the James Beard publications about her employee assistance program. Oh, and your writing there is wonderful too. So oh, if you thanks. go to the it's the, like James Beard, it's, it's the blog there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she, I mean, that was the first I had. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm not in the industry anymore, so I don't always know exactly what's going on. But to hear about that, that, you know, that her employees have health insurance, but they also have this employee assistance program that's where they can um, call. They have a num- numbers they can call for various crises and get referrals mm-hmm. to mental health or legal, you know, uh, advice or, you know, just various uh, life crisis stuff well and she had you know she had to set that up in the wake of 
uh, yeah. <laughs> some stuff in, in, in that particular empire and, yeah. and offer care to, to people. So for mm-hmm. people don't have the background on it, um, restaurant with John Besh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who uh, was, you know, accused of a whole lot of, of, of misconduct mm-hmm. and various other bad behaviors. So they had to, you know, really scramble into place and get you know, HR mm-hmm. <laughs> in place mm-hmm. and safe communication channels. Cause I think that's the thing that happens. People don't feel safe in a restaurant. If it's, especially if it's a small business, mm-hmm. like going right to the owner of it, right. there's gotta be a, a safe way to uh, report things, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and it's, and taking care. So yeah, so Kelly's done some really, and uh, so we actually recorded a podcast with her, which oh, great. Uh, we will release at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and talking about like, okay, you know, figure out like what was wrong with the system and, and trying to course correct for that and really mm-hmm. make sure that people felt safe and open and, mm-hmm. and all that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, apart from that, I don't, I mean, I think, you know, and then money obviously is the, is, you know, if you, oh, God, you feel fearful because you don't, you know, am I going to be able to pay my rent or, you know, am I, I'm not saving anything for retirement yeah. or how am I going to pay my taxes? You know, all of these, all of these things. So I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> it's becomes a global issue. It's like, well, there's all this wealth in the world, you know, and mm-hmm. how is it that, you know, more and more of us are feeling financially insecure? I mean, these are problems that I am not equipped to solve, but right. I, I think about them. Worry, you know? actually. <laughs> yes. Fix it. I'm going to solve wealth inequality and worldwide. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is really, mm-hmm. except that just these, these small, these small things and, you know, the chefs that are able to, to change over to a tip included model and so that their cooks are making, you know, uh, a salary that's commensurate with what the front of the house is making. I mean, that's, I know that's a very difficult thing. And you know, yeah. I have Amanda Cohen, who I also shouted out at, at WCR is, has, has committed to it. She's doing it. It's, she's had it baked in since the beginning. Like mm-hmm. the way that she set up dirt candy mm-hmm. was really with her people in mind in a mm-hmm. deeply meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, and then you're retaining people. I mean, it's, I, again, like I don't, you know, I'm not a restaurant operator, you know, and I know that the 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 challenges are are many. You know, I'm I'm close with a with a chef who runs a, a big kitchen in New York, and we talk all the time about just, you know, he'll tell me a story about you know one personnel issue or one supply issue, and it's it sounds incredibly stressful, and he's like, well, that's one percent of my day, you know, <laughs> um, you know, it's just a constant like who's showing up to work, are they drunk. Um, right. You know, did the carrots come in? You know, oh, now this sink is leaking. I mean, not that I people, you know, obviously, if you if you know, you know, you know, but um, the level of the level of stress is, um, you know, I'm somebody who works from home. I'm very I feel very lucky, you know, yeah. to uh, to not have to. Uh, and, I, and I still feel scared a lot of the time and insecure and, and anxious about the future. So um it's, I mean, you and I have bonded over anxiety yeah. before. I think I sent you one of the first copies of my book about mm-hmm. anxiety, mm-hmm. along with the squishy bunny. Yes, yes. Uh, which, yeah. which, so the, the thing with the squishy bunny, um, it's, it, it's uh, so there's a rabbit on the cover of my book. And they originally, the marketing team was, they were saying, what is the little thing we can send out to people with it? And they mm-hmm. originally wanted a pill bottle with the candy inside. What? And I said, did you not <laughs> read the chapter where going off medication very nearly killed me. Oh um, and I said, how about a stress toy? Because yeah. I really love stress toys mm-hmm. and got them to make a squishy, <clears throat> a squishy little bunny thing. Um, yeah. I've spent a lot of time squishing little uh, things <laughs> over the last year. So yeah. It, um, I, uh, after it happened, actually the next day I had to go to Charleston for, mm. uh, f- f- the fab conference, which is okay. really fantastic. Now what is that? Food and beverage. It okay. turns out it's, um, and this woman, uh, uh, Randy Weinstein runs it. It's all women, uh-huh. um, all, all different levels of the industry get together and there are panel discussions and it's just, mm. you know, it, it's just a really, really smart, thoughtful conference. And I was on several panels about self-care where I was thinking, and I mean, I flat out said like, I suck at it. I have no idea how to do this. I, you know, I just just, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'm a fraud up here. Oh. L- luckily, you know, there were a lot of other people up there who were saying like, oh, I don't really know how to do it too, but let's just have really honest conversations about it. And I needed, you know, and I was around community of people. Um, but right as I was there, I got a call um, from, uh, you know, my now boss here at Food and Wine who said, can you go to Aspen? Because mm. it was a week after. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually the week before I had been in Atlanta 
um, and we had closed door sessions for people in the restaurant industry just to talk through mental health stuff. Uh, Kim Severson ran uh, one panel about uh, recovery and I mm. ran one about mental health and it, it's amazing and I think it's probably okay to say this like you know Seamus Mullen who's been a guest on this podcast was so open and fantastic about everything he's gone through. Mm-hmm. So this was the week before mm-hmm. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. right after went to that and then um, I went to Aspen and we were thinking like what do we do like what is the what is the thing to do and sort of came up with a model of like let's just get people together to talk Mm -hmm. so I thought who do I really um, trust to be part of this to kind of guide a conversation with me Um, Andrew Zimmern Mm. who, uh, you know, has been an absolute rock for, for me and for my mental health. Hugh Atchison, mm. um, same, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I can you know, text him whenever and he, and he is there. And, uh, Jen Heidegger, uh, Kendrick, who runs the giving kitchen. Okay. Um, and you know, and she's been through, through loss and stuff, you know, from, from illness. And we just kind of put out the word to, uh, the people who in the industry, who we knew were going to be there, found a mm-hmm. restaurant that was, uh, not open yet. Mm. And got a bunch of boxes of tissues mm. <laughs> and had people just talk. And it was people at all levels of the industry and, and just had an open conversation about it. Um, and I think the, the thing that came out of that was that uh, people brought it back to their communities, whatever city they were in, and had conversations from there. And then I traveled um for the next few weeks, I I was booked to go to different cities anyway, and then other people were booking me to speak uh, just about mental health stuff after mm. this. Because again, can't say this enough. Don't want to speculate about the sure. whys, the wherefores, or whatever. Because it's it's somebody else's head, somebody else's life, and and all that stuff. And it does it does no good. Right. It does zero right. good to speculate. Um, and I, but it set up a model where I would go to other cities and just sort of put out the word. Um, Sometimes it was in front of a bigger audience. Sometimes it was closed door and just be like, whoever wants to talk. Mm -hmm. Actually, the night of, um, I already had dinner planned with the people from Olympia Provisions, Mm -hmm. um, Eli Cairo, who I've known. And I, you know, did all these like seven or eight interviews and wrote a story and stuff. And I was like, and ended up having dinner with him. And he said, oh, if you're ever in Portland, we can get people together there. And Mm -hmm. as it turned out, I was going to Portland in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just went through sort of a few weeks of doing that. But you were saying you traveled to get away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I traveled, and I got too far into my own head. Yeah. But I so I ended up um, going on medication at the end of the uh, at the end of the summer, which was mm-hmm. a great thing for my head. Mm-hmm. And I also uh, I and I and I think I've talked about this before, but I um, I screamed. I kept mm-hmm. making jokes uh, about getting my car and screaming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, throughout the Brett Kavanaugh hearings where all, like oh, every God. woman I knew wanted to yeah. scream. And I finally, um, you know, Douglas and I have this church upstate, um, this deconsecrated church with great acoustics. And I said, it's time. And he took the dogs out and I uh, cranked up some music um, and I screamed from the bottom of my stomach and I screamed for Tony. Mm-hmm. And I screamed until I almost threw up on the carpet. Mm. And then my entire body rebooted mm. um, in my head, <laughs> my body, everything. And I was able to sort of move forward and take care of myself. Wow. How have you taken care of yourself? What is your your thing? Like, I know you're going through re- recovery, yeah, going through yeah, new life. All yeah. The... I mean, I was so grateful that I was already not drinking when yeah, this happened. That was in Because place. I feel like yeah. had I been, you know, I would saw some of the people around me were drinking. And, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah, know, yeah. it's just that's that's for them do to, do. to <laughs> deal. But, I, you know, for me, I was glad that I didn't have that to um, to turn to. Uh, so, you know, like I said, weekly therapy, uh, I had, I had been on antidepressants, uh, and I just continued to do that and continue to do so. Um, you know, at some point I, I realized that I had to, like, the only way I was going to feel better about this work was to actually start it. And, yeah. and one of the, you know, one of the ways I needed to be able to truly start it and commit to it was to quit smoking pot. But if I'm being very honest, <laughs> what really got me to quit smoking pot was I needed to get a life insurance policy as a condition of my divorce. And um, I went to speak with the the agent and, you know, it was very 
transparent about my situation and and that I smoke pot. And he said, well, if you know, if they're going to do a blood test and physical, and if it comes out that you've got THC in your blood, then you're going to be charged the same rate as a cigarette smoker, and okay. it's significantly more expensive. And this is coming out of my own pocket, so I really came down to like, <laughs> I want to save money. Economics, yeah. Sure. I, I, the reason is any. <laughs> I mean, I think I was really primed to quit, but I needed some external impetus. You knew, yeah. Sometimes that other excuse, and yeah. you can put it on. I'm doing it for my kids. Yeah. yeah. So I, so I was like, well, I'll just you know, I'll quit for three weeks. I'll have the physical, and then maybe I'll see how I feel. And like right away, I was like, oh, yes, this is what I needed. This is what I've needed to do for a while. What so. does it feel like? Like the, like is it a veil lifting? Like what's the physicality of it? It just, I mean, I don't know that I felt. Honestly, it's it's that I had, I wasn't. Um, so tired, you know, it was something that would just make me tired. I mean, right. my, that's not a surprise, really. But uh, I, I, my energy levels were more consistent throughout the day. And, you know, co- like sort of counterintuitively, I, this was a drug that I was using, I thought, to manage my anxiety. And once I stopped using it, I became much less anxious. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. For me, I mean, it just it, it, I had just turned a corner where it was like, it just was, it wasn't, it was having the opposite uh, effect that I intended it to have. So That's taking, amazing. Wow. Yeah. So taking that out of the equation really just like I felt s- on so much more of an even keel. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel guilty, you know, yeah. like it didn't feel, I didn't have to feel like, oh, what a fucking loser I am. It's two in the afternoon and mm-hmm. I'm stoned and now I'm like useless and I'm going to go eat a bag of chips, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so... And then, I, you know, just like cardiovascularly, you know, I also yeah. uh, this time last year I was smoking cigarettes, um, which I mean. Oh, that's a huge uh, yeah. uh, thing to give up. I mean, too. it's something that I had gone in and out of. And, yeah. you know, as my stress levels ramped up with the divorce and Tony's imagine. death, I was just like all in, you know, and I was yeah. like, this is so Again, fucking stupid I mean, and gross. What? And, you know, but it's like I just whatever. If you had told me last year at this time that I would not be smoking cigarettes, nor would I even be chewing the nicotine gum, which was something wow. I also was big wow. into and I wouldn't be smoking pot. I'd be like, you're crazy. Um, but so again, it's been a bitch of a it's year. It's been a bitch of a year. Yeah. So but <laughs> title of your memoir. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, there was there was there are a lot of voices in the in the 12 step rooms um I would hear people say things about, you know, I'm not drinking, but I'm still smoking pot, or I'm really mad because I'm not drinking and my partner's not drinking, but he's still smoking pot. Or, you know, there was mm-hmm. a lot of disparagement or, or a lot of questioning around, is it or is it not okay to smoke pot or to do these other drugs if we have quit drinking? And I would always be kind of defensive. I would never talk about it. I would never, like, you know, admit to my own pot smoking in the rooms. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, it, it definitely stuck with me. You know, I, I can think of the faces of the people that said specific things about pot because I was like, I didn't yeah. want to hear that, you know, even right. though I knew it to be something I would have to sort of reckon with. So the, the you know, having already being on a path of recovery and mm-hmm. then really f- and and getting to go into the rooms and getting to actually truly engage with the program because I felt I was just kind of circling it uh, for you know, a year and a half or so, um, because I felt like, well, I'm not being on it. Like I'm not, I'm not really sober, you know, I'm just not drinking. Um, so I never, I didn't get a sponsor. I didn't start to work the steps. I didn't do any of the things that are suggested as a course of true recovery, really engaging with it because I felt like, well, I'm not there yet. I'm not ready yet. You know, it still was very helpful to me, but now being all in on it, um, is a whole, you know, and I'm just getting started. You know, I've been working on step one for months and I don't, yeah. you know, I'm not sure when I'm going to move to step two. I'm not in any hurry. Um, and it is, you know, there are so many cliches and it's so easy to kind of dismiss. And I certainly have rolled my eyes at, at some of the of the cliches. But, um, you know, like they say, it works if you work it. So and it's not for everybody, you know, and I didn't know if it was for me. Um, and, it, it, you know, there are more there's more than one way to recover. But for me, it's been it's been a tremendous uh, source of, of support. Well, I think it's also this. is I'm so grateful that you're talking about this because you don't necessarily like outside of rooms like hear a lot of women talk about it it's Mm -hmm. you know and in the food world there's this sort of great arc of redemption of all like hedonists like Mm -hmm. you know doing this but you don't hear about the women and it affects a lot of 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 women Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it probably looks like a different thing in in women than it than it does and especially since we're you know leaned on for caretaking in all different kinds of ways even if we're not parents Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. you know whatever it is 
And, you know, it's, I, which is why I'm just extra grateful that when, especially when you started talking about it on your podcast, mm-hmm. I, cause I, I remember you had told, told me, and then I sort of figured you were uh, like going along with it and stuff. Yeah. But then there was just one particular episode where you were, you know, it was just all in mm-hmm. and I appreciated that so much. And I sort of feel like if, you know, if I had a friend who wanted to go into that, like I would have them listen to that episode of it because you're also funny as hell. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I, I get like with this podcast, it's, it's like this world of characters who they have created. A sort of sleazy uh, <laughs> man named Cliss. There's there's mm-hmm. the references to going full dinty. That mm-hmm. actually is a sort of story of depression. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. You know. um, yeah. It's it's been a nice uh, thing to have to have that outlet. Um, you know, I I think that there's a couple of reasons why people don't talk about it that much, or women don't talk yeah. about it. Certainly, I mean, there's you know. The word anonymous is in, you know, many, many 12 step programs are, you know, so I think sometimes there's a misconception that it means that, you know, that there's a veil of shame or there's a veil of secrecy. And I don't think it's I think the anonymous part more comes from, you know, what's what's gets said in the room stays in the rooms and we're not talking about other people's recovery. Um, But, I you know, I, I think that anytime that there's light, more light shed on it. I mean, I myself, before I ever even really considered getting sober, would I remember distinctly listening to interviews with other people on Julie Klausner's podcast mm-hmm. and certainly on Mark Maron's podcast and yeah. him talking about his own sobriety. And those were it was just so, so helpful to hear a funny, creative, uh, flawed person yeah. just talk about their their experience with it, you know, in a way that wasn't, I mean, my, my, I think my understanding of, of recovery was very, it's, it, my, was, was wrong. And I thought it was sort of like church and sort of like, uh, you know, (laughs) it's, it's, I've heard somebody say yesterday at a program or at a meeting, it's not a program of don'ts, you know? And so that Mm. to be, to understand that it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a suggested course of recovery and here's things you can do. And it's not about, punishment you know I grew up Catholic so it's oh, like same. <laughs> the whole structure of I myself you know, recovering Catholic yeah, <laughs> of you have done wrong and here are the things you need to do to make it right or ten Hail you know, Marys yeah three our fathers <laughs> and it's not that I mean I think so that for some people it dovetails nicely with the with mm-hmm. the Catholic faith but it's not certainly not a requirement um you know to and it's not the way it's not the the, the way that it's administered yeah so um yeah I I'm always happy to talk about it uh, and and talk to people about it. I've I've had the pleasure of of speaking at a couple of meetings where mm. you sort of tell your story, uh, which can be you know it's it's hard. You have to sort of keep yourself from trying to make it too funny or you know it's like it's not about like let me tell you all the crazy awesome <laughs> things I did when I was drunk, but you know sort of your story from you know what it was like and then you know how things have changed and um you know and I've heard hundreds of other people's stories and sometimes they are really funny, you know, yeah. and it's, and that's great too. Um, but it's, but what you realize after hearing so many of them is that it's, we're all kind of the same, you know, yeah. it's like no <laughs> addict is so special and unique that their problems can't be addressed if they're willing, you know, by this fellowship. So, so what does a good self-care day look like? Uh, for you like you know in addition to like going to a meeting like yeah. how do you, you know if you're brought up not talking about stuff and maybe not for self-care and you're doing a, a project that's got to be pretty emotionally grueling yeah what's the what are the things you do to take care of yourself I'll tell you that's this perfect question because I just came off of a couple of really good days where oh, um <laughs> yeah I'm so glad to hear that uh so I have uh um I have a new project that's not related to Tony and that's um and I was nervous about taking it on because I thought, do I have time to do this one, but also do finish the Tony stuff? And what I realized in starting it is that it feels like I, it's, I guess it's sort of like, you know, swinging two bets in the on deck circle or, you know, lifting a bunch of weights and then just lifting up your own arms. It's like to do this non Tony related project, it feels incredibly light and joyful and oh. fun, which really what it did is help me realize like, and and acknowledge that the stuff it is hard it's hard and heavy yeah. to be you know co-authoring a book with a ghost and to be interviewing the people that he was closest to about a man that's no longer with us and i think just being able to feel that i deserve you know whatever it is the space to to see oh this this is hard emotional work you know has been really um great in a way that it sounds counterintuitive but it's like oh i there's a reason why i felt like you know <laughs> like a rain cloud over my head for the past year yeah. you know 
Um, but it, in terms of a self self care day, I mean, I've I've had a couple of days where my my son was was with his dad, and so I was I had just, and I was very uh, conscious of not making any plans. And, oh, that uh, feels so good. <laughs> so it's just me alone in my apartment. The weather has been beautiful, um, and I've just you know I've given myself a lot of time to write, to work on this other project, which I find very pleasurable. Uh, I've been taking naps, you know, oh, and sometimes I feel really I guilty about that. But it's like I'm I am at my core. I'm a nap person. And so I'm like, if I'm tired, I will take a nap. I will wake up when I'm done sleeping and then I will keep working. And so I just had this couple of days of, of and it's I know it's an absolute luxury. You know, not everybody gets to have three or four days over a holiday weekend to just be alone and do their things. But that was I knew like this morning when I woke up, like I'm now I'm ready. Like my son will come over after school and I'll have him for a few days and I am ready to like be a good parent to him. Um, and I've gotten a ton of sleep, you know, and I've and I got good work done, but I didn't like kill myself. You know, I went and I I, I bought a bag of candy and I ate it. You oh. know, I mean, I, there are times in my life where I've been incredibly uh, neurotic and restrictive around food, you know, for better or worse and mostly worse, you know, even though it's like maybe I think I look good in a photo, but like, you know, the what it takes to get there and the amount of like negative self-talk that it takes to get there, is it worth it? I don't know. So I decided yesterday, like, I'm going to, I want some some candy. I'm going to go fucking buy it and I'm going to go eat the whole bag. Did you say candy? <laughs> Why, yes, I did. Oh my God, what? <laughs> what is would, oh would my you describe God. for the audience who is listening <laughs> right. what I've just presented you? I with. feel like this is a cubic foot of high chew, individually wrapped high chews. But it is a piece of oh art. Yes. If you look at the back and it's signed on the side. A, this was actually donated by a co-worker wow. um, who <laughs> was uh, given this by the Hai Chi representatives who I did send your mm-hmm. way at one yes. point. So the podcast, the, the Carb Face uh, podcast mm-hmm. is uh, has frequent mentions of, of Hai Chi yeah. uh, on it as a great snack and you have, you share candy with your guests. Um, and I, I think wow. they reached out to me and I said, do you know about this podcast? And, and you interviewed them. Mm-hmm. But uh, this appeared on uh, my colleague's desk and uh, I asked if I could give it to you. <laughs> that is outrageous. So it's plex- It's a plexiglass frame that is stuffed with individually wrapped high chew, sweet and sour, watermelon, lemon, and some other flavor. Grapefruit. And it's beautiful. There's a weird print on the back of it, too. It's like sort of if you look under the candy. Uh, oh, there yeah. Is there's pretty... like sort of a, a water, like a um, a wallpaper of the same. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and it's signed by the artist, <laughs> Robin Blair. Amazing. Uh, but I, wow. I, I wanted you to uh, have that as a as oh, a candy fiend. <laughs> thank you. Oh, my God. I, I don't know if it fits your home decor or whatever, does. but I knew that you had a new apartment. Yes. <laughs> and I have mostly bare walls. I, I've, I've, <laughs> I just haven't had the headspace to really deal with getting art. And I've just started to buy art. I bought this beautiful painting of a, of a woman uh, with no shirt on, oh, I said, happily that on eating Insta- Cheetos. That was yes. on your Instagram. And it was yes. really, this yeah. artist. Young artist Kat Giordano, uh, based in in Massachusetts, and um, she's doing great work. So, yeah. And this also, like to me, I, I wish it said sweet and bitter on there mm-hmm. too, because it, it also, you know, you were uh, you're a person who is one of the funniest, funniest humans oh, and stuff. But you also you. have the deepness within, and you've been so kind as to you. You have an, an uncanny sense for when I need somebody to reach out and say how oh. you doing, and you've popped into my inbox in some really moments when it really mattered, and I appreciate that well, so much. Back at you, man. Uh, so what is the thing that you want people, like a thought you want to put in people's head about Tony that they might not know that? Hmm. Some... Uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, he shared so much of himself, uh, you know, in his writing and, and on television. Uh, I, I think that, and, and you know, he, he people started to call him like, the world's most interesting man or, you know, <laughs> like the, the Dos Equis guy. Yeah. And then he himself would say, like, I've got the best job in the world mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, my life is amazing. Um, I think, you know, I, I guess, and, and, I, and I know that there was a sense of, like, if this guy, like you said it, if if this guy with this life and this amazing story didn't find life worth living and, and a world worth sticking around in, like, what is there for me? Um, so I guess I would just ask people to sort of think a little beyond that and just know that, you know, he was a gifted performer, you know, and, and a gifted storyteller. And that, um, you know, there, there, there were ways in which, uh, 
you know, that things were, were not great. And and he was a human, flawed human being. And he also was very transparent about his, his struggles in some ways, you know. So just to kind of remember that, that he was a that he was a full human being and, and that, um, you know, just because you have a wildly successful television program and, and uh, you know, 10 million tw- Twitter followers or whatever, you know, if, if, if there's some, some other thing that's fundamentally lacking, if there's a, if there's a, a structure that's lacking there, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So, you, you know, it's, it, I don't know. I'm not really. I'm not really think, summarizing this so eloquently, but um, you know, just that that he was, that there was more. There was more to it than just the the surface glamour and 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 brilliance. Um, you know that that he was a flawed human being, like like anyone else. Yeah, and that is a gift. So there is a question I ask of everybody mm-hmm. um, because I think it helps to say it out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, you have taken care of so many people as mm-hmm. we have established. What is the selfish thing you want for you? Oh, what is a selfish thing I want and, for me? And this is so if you say it out loud, other people can help you get this thing. Okay. All right. Um, so we're talking like a, a career goal or an object or it can be anything. Anything. Wow. Oh. Um I really, I've always really wanted to, and I haven't quite figured out how to like manifest it. I've always, I've, 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 I've thought that a cruise might be like the worst thing in the world. <laughs> you know, like I, I right. love David Foster Wallace's right. <laughs> uh, supposedly fun thing I'll never do again. And it sort of set my, my expectation for, okay, well, that's not something I want. But there are these, um, smart cruises or sort of right. like uh you know evolved cruises that um that go to some of the most interesting places in the world and there's one to the Galapagos Ooh. and uh I have always thought for like I've tried to figure out for years like can I do a story I don't think the food of the Galapagos is really like the thing you know like so but if I can figure out a way to get myself and maybe my son uh, on one of these Galapagos cruises that I feel like would be, um, and I, I I don't know. I mean, and it may be one of those things where I get there and go, oh, yeah, no, I do not want to live on a boat. As it turns <laughs> out, I, I hate this. But I feel like that that is some, that's something I've always kind of come back to for years is, is I want to get myself there. Dear universe, <laughs> yes. and Laurie to the Galapagos. So my version here of your lots of likes or mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. sort of questions you do at the end. Um, these are rapid fire. Don't oh think too hard. Okay. What's your comfort food? Oh, you can sip your, your okay, coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, coffee is one of them. but uh, <laughs> Gummy candy. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I sent you some Haribo mm-hmm. or something like mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a particular favorite gummy? Uh, I'm really into the uh, fizzy cola, the Haribo fizzy cola, but um, Haichu also makes a fizzy cola uh, Haichu that I think is is fantastic, and I can I can take down a, a bag of those with no trouble at all. Yeah, Universe also maybe oh God if Haichu had a cruise, mm. <laughs> <laughs> a high cruise. Oh my God, <laughs> so many possibilities. So many. Um, what is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Oh. Huh. Uh, I was, um, I had a, a, a beautiful meal in Paris with, uh, with uh, somebody that I'm dating. Ooh. Uh, that was exactly kind of what we had both wanted for the trip. Uh, that was, um, that was just, yeah, there was just, it was like sort of a perfect moment of happiness and a high point of the trip. And it was, uh, it was at uh, Brasserie Lip in Paris where I had never been before. And it was, um, yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, it was like Tony would have called it dinosaur era food. Um, that <laughs> Those was creams and butter and, yeah, it was, and canals um, of things. Yeah, big, uh, like, you know, plate of fries. And uh, I, you know, I'm not even remembering the specifics of the food itself. Well, it was like um, chocrut. That's what it was. Oh, yeah. And it was just, you know, and, and this beautiful snappy service. And, you know, just one of those things where you feel like you've traveled back in time. And yet it's very much 2019. And so wonderful that people are still uh, doing things the way that they're doing. You know, and the guy put the fries down and he said, do you want ketchup? And I said, no, thank you. And he said, that's right. So you do not want ketchup. Like he was so thrilled that the dumb American didn't want ketchup for her fries. And yeah, it was just, it was a really, really happy time. And uh, and uh, just, you know, 
a, a great memory. I'm so glad you got to have that. Yeah. That's lovely. What is the last meal that somebody cooked for you in their home? Oh, uh, gosh, it's been a while, honestly. Like, I find I don't find myself going to people's homes. I, I can't remember that somebody needs to invite me to dinner yeah <laughs> I think so I mean I honestly feel like it's been it's been months is that weird and now I'm, as soon as I leave I'm gonna I'm gonna remember and I'm gonna be like oh sorry so and so I totally forgot about that thing but I feel like my memory is a little bit even though I don't smoke pot anymore I feel like yeah. my memory has become a little bit porous well, I mean this this last year you know I'm sure there are pockets yeah. and holes in it. yeah so please somebody you know this is food and wine pro there are chefs who listen to this and you know a, <laughs> a goodly amount of them. actually no I, I take that back I so it wasn't in my home but it was in a an Airbnb I had a beautiful um risotto cooked for me with uh with um chorizo and then the ste and uh the steamed leaves of uh kohlrabi that were Ooh. then pureed with the chorizo broth and it was fucking delicious who cooked it this is my same friend that i went oh, to brasserie friend. lip with yeah that's nice to have friends <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's yeah, lovely. a friend who who is a very good cook. Yay! So. What living musician would you want to? Well, I you know I ask this of chefs, mm -hmm. um, but but what you're a cookbook writer too, so I will say, what living musician would you want to cook for, and what would you cook for them? Oh, um, Nico Case. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> whose music I have loved for so long. Oh, she's so great. And she's great on Twitter, too. Yes. So oh, funny. She's so delicious. And I'm pretty sure she's a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, if she's not, I apologize. But I, I, if I had to guess, I'd say she's a vegetarian. Um, so I would do, I just did this this pasta the other day for, for me and my son, and I loved it. It was lentil pasta because um, he's, we're not eating gluten right now mm -hmm. and gut stuff. Um and it was, uh, I had leftover riced cauliflower that I mixed up with a beaten egg and uh, put it in with the hot pasta and kind of mm. let the egg cook and then put nutritional yeast on it. And it sounds so like hippie, you know, nutritional whatever. Nutritional yeast is amazing. Uh, yeah, it's, it was delicious. Um, so I, I felt proud enough of that dish that I would want to serve that to Nico Case. Oh, dear Nico Case. <laughs> <laughs> Come over. Yeah. <laughs> She's, she is phenomenal. And that's yeah. an excellent, excellent choice. Thanks. Uh, last question. Mm -hmm. You have five uninterrupted minutes for self-care. What do you do? Uh, I put on uh, this this dumb mask that I have this like uh, it's like it's called like temporary lifting mask mm -hmm. so you put it on and it's a clay mask and it dries and then like for a day you look mm. slightly <laughs> you know I don't know what it does really but it makes me feel good when I do it and uh, so I would I would put that mask on and let it dry and uh, while it dried I would listen to one of my favorite podcasts which is called um Retail Nightmares. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, so good. These two brilliant women in Vancouver uh, have guests on. They talk about retail nightmares or retail dreams. They talk about animals a lot. They're really funny. And I've sort of formed a little friendship with them, although we've never oh. met in person. But we have like, a, you know, a Twitter DM thread going and um, we send each other little gifts. And I mean, it's very, it, I, it feels sort of very good young girlish in a way, you know, to have these like little I, pen pals. I, no, I totally have those and I love it yeah. so much. <laughs> so I would, I would, I would let the mask dry. I would listen to retail nightmares and then I would um, rinse it off. Yeah. I really hope that this next year is filled with, with joy for you, Thank you. and, and goodness and calmness and good meals with your, your friend. Yes, <laughs> yes. I hope so too. And other things. And I just can't say enough. Like, thank you for, for putting it out there and, and making life a little easier for people. So people don't feel like freaks. So people mm. feel like they're together. And I just, thank you. Lori oh Wolver. my God. Thank you. It's, you know, let me talk about myself for 45 <laughs> minutes. I'm in. Well, it's generous and lovely. And people <laughs> can hear more of you on Carb Face, yes. which is this fantastic podcast that I highly recommend people listen to you'll laugh you'll cry yep. or you'll feel very uncomfortable <laughs> at various subscribe five stars don't listen with your kids yes very much don't listen with your kids <laughs> but it's so such a great thing you can find you on socials at laurie uh whatever yep and then you so you've written appetites and then mm -hmm. you have books coming out yes it's pretty far in the future to talk about dates or any real specifics but i have a travel book that should be coming out next year and the oral biography uh coming out sometime in the same 
general time span. <laughs> Got to be sort of general with yeah. these things, but um, but I, they are they are in the works, and hopefully you will uh, enjoy them and and learn a little bit more about Tony from them. Yeah, Lori, thank you so much for thank that. Thank you. Thank you to our producers Jennifer Martinick and Alicia Cabral. Thanks to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song. If you like what you heard, please tell a friend, write a review, or rate us. As you know, that mm-hmm. matters. The stars, the mm-hmm. the ratings. If there is something you would like for us to talk about or a guest you'd like to hear from, please let us know. I'm going to shout out Crisis Text Line one more time. Text 741-741-247. Someone will be there to listen. You can find me on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip, where I am all the dang time. Find out more about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and Food and Wine's YouTube page. Thank you so much for listening and take good care of yourself until the next time. 